Greetings and welcome back to 303. We are in Senior English A, and we are studying now the uh, Spencer Sonnet number 35 on page 254. Sonnet number 35. Let's pay attention now to uh, the primary idea of this at 2A, at 2A, the primary idea of this sonnet. Here's what I want to try and play a game with you, though. Let's try this. You've been working now for a while with these different kinds of writings. Let's just read this poem one time through and see if you can identify even one main idea at 2A, okay? On your own without my help. Granted, obviously you're gonna know it after I help you, but let's see if you can figure it out on your own, okay? Here we go. Sonnet 35, we're reading the 14 line sonnet with the iambic pentameter and the rhyme scheme and all that stuff we've talked about before. Read along with me and let's see how well you do. Sonnet 35, page 254. My hungry eyes through greedy covetous, still to behold the object of their pain. With no contentment can themselves suffice, but having pine and having not complain. For lacking it, they cannot life sustain, and having it, they gaze on it the more, in their amazement like Narcissus vain, whose eyes him starved so plenty makes me poor. Yet are mine eyes so filled with the store of that fair sight, that nothing else they brook, but loathe the things which they did like before, and can no more endure on them to look. All this world's <coughs> glory seemeth vain to me, and all their shows but shadows, saving sheep. All right, let's pause for a moment. Before I, even, before I even exegete this poem, can you come up with a single idea? Go ahead and write it down really quickly at, three, at 2A. Get, try to at least write down one idea from the poem we just read of your own study, of your own reading. Okay? And then we'll come back now uh, uh, to it and we'll work through it together. All right? Notice the opening lines. Uh, and hey, 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 your footnotes here are really necessary because we're reading a poem from 1600 and words and their definitions change over time. So for example, the word covetize means to desire excessively. To covet means to want something really badly, okay? So let's read it, shall we? Let's go to work with it. Let's see if we can figure out what's being said in this, can we say it out loud, love poem. We've got another love poem. We can write that down right away. My hungry eyes through greedy covetous, still to behold the object of their pain. Put it in your own words. What's he say about his hungry eyes? Now this is, of course, a very famous rendering, but it's a funny one at first. It's not intuitive. Hungry tummy, get it. Hungry eyes? Jot down what you think it even means. How can your eyes be hungry? How can your eyes be hungry? I get how my tummy can be hungry, especially right before lunch, but what about my eyes? How can my eyes be hungry? Of course, all we're really saying is, I want what I see. I want what my eyes see. But then notice in the second line, to behold or to look at them is the object of their pain. In other words, I'm looking at something that I want and not to get it causes me pain. Which obviously begs the question, dude, why are you still looking at it then? Stop looking. To which he's going to respond, yeah, I, I would stop if I could. Now, of course, we know that this is Spencer writing a poem to his girl. So already, we kind of have a sense of what he's actually starting to say. Look at the next lines. With no contentment can themselves suffice. I can't look at her enough. It's an interesting idea. Okay, I'm going to look at my girl until I'm tired of looking at my girl. Now I'm looking at my girl all the time. I can't look at her enough. Of course, you can imagine that she's going to read this and go, oh, that's very sweet. Thank you. Look at the next one. But having pine, pine here meaning yearn, and having not complain. In other words, if I'm with her, it's never enough. If I'm not with her, all I can do is complain about not being with her. For lacking, keep reading line five, for lacking going without, for lacking it, they cannot life sustain, and having it, they gaze on it the more. 
In other words, if all I do is look at my girl, I cannot live my life because it kind of paralyzes me. I don't do anything else, right? But if I don't look on my girl, then I'm kind of like paralyzed too. Either way, he says, I'm kind of stuck. I'm stuck in a situation that I can't seem to get out of because of my love for this girl. Notice, he then is going to make a reference. Let's write it at 2B. This is the allusion. A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N. Remember, an allusion is a reference to another literary text. Here, it's the, st the famous story of Narcissus. Write down. There's your footnote at number four. Narcissus. Greek mythology. A youth who fell in love with his own reflection in a pool, wasted away with yearning, and was changed after his death into the Narcissus flower. A gorgeous guy gorgeous guy named Narcissus. He would walk into the mall and every single person would stop talking and look at him and go, oh, right? That kind of guy. For those of you maybe who are Justin Bieber fans who think Justin Bieber is a stunningly handsome kid, same project. Everywhere this kid goes, everyone wants to talk about how stunningly beautiful he is. Narcissus goes to the pond, the water. He looks over to get a drink and all of a sudden he sees his own reflection and he goes oh that's the most beautiful thing i've ever seen i've never seen anything as amazingly stunningly beautiful as that i have to look at it some more and then some more and then some more in greek mythology of course it's always the extreme right narcissus are you ready for this he cannot look away from his own reflection and he dies because he cannot look away he literally sits there and he can't leave it. To call someone a narcissistic person then means they're always interested in just themselves, right? But here, we're going to use the idea of narcissus in a little interesting way. Up to this point, we've talked about hungry eyes. Eyes that want to just look at his girl all the time, but know it's probably a bad idea. Of course, eyes that want to look at something and can't look away, that would make sense with Narcissus. Let's read it now. Take a look. In their amazement, in, in his eyes' amazement, like Narcissus' vein, whose eyes him starved, so plenty makes me poor. Yet are mine eyes so filled with the store of that fair sight that nothing else they brook, that is to say want, but loathe the things which they did like before and can no more endure on them to look. He says, I used to like to look at lots and lots of girls. Loved it. Loved to look at beautiful women. Then all of a sudden I see my girl. And now I can't look at anything else. All I want to do is to look at her. And all I want to do is to write poems about her. And I'm not interested in anything else anymore. Right Now, students who have jumped, jumped down to 3B really quickly, students who have debated about this thing called love and whether it really exists or not, will often say, I know that feeling of being in love because the only thing I care about looking at all of a sudden is the thing I'm in love with. That's it. I got no interest in anything else. Everything else kind of bores me. The stuff that used to be interesting to me, not anymore. All I'm interested in is looking or talking to that person, being with that person. Consuming almost, we would say. Notice he finishes Sonnet 35. All this world's glory seemeth vain to me, and all their shows but shadows, saving sheep. In other words, he says it this way. Let's put it in our notes at 2A. I can only focus on my girl because I love her so much. And so I'm kind of stuck. I'm stuck. My eyes are hungry for only seeing her. Let's jump to, uh, really quickly, 3A. What is for you your favorite love story where in the movie there is, or the film or show or whatever, there is this understanding about the attraction with the eyes and looking at that person. Is there a scene in a movie, for example, where the guy looks at the girl or the girl looks at the guy the two lovers look at each other, and there's this sense of immediately falling in love. What we call love at first sight. Of course, the classic example in this tradition, let's write it in our notes, 1600 for a rough working date, is Romeo and Juliet, 
right? Often forgotten is that Romeo goes to the party that night to see his girl, would be girl, not his girl, would be girl, <coughs> Rosaline. That's who he's in love with. In fact, he's gone so far as to say he's ready to commit suicide if she won't answer his text. She's not answering his texts. And his pal says, don't go to the party because that's a bad idea. Unless you want to go to the party to look at other girls. And he says it. Romeo says it. How am I going to look at other girls? There is only one girl for the rest of my life. And her name is Rosaline. And Rosaline's at the party. I'm going to the party. He shows up at the party. Over Rosaline's shoulder is Juliet. And the minute he sees Juliet, oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright? Totally forgotten about Rosaline. Now, only thing he's interested in is Juliet. Whoa. Let's jump to 3D. Do you believe in love at first sight? Do you believe in the idea that two total strangers could walk into a mall? People everywhere. Let's say it's on a, you know, on a Saturday when everybody's shopping, right? Two total strangers could walk into a mall. They're walking down the hall of the mall, coming at each other, and all of a sudden, look up, eyes meet, love. And one of the two says, I've never seen anything like that in my life. I'll never see anything like that in my life again. That is what i got to be with for the rest of my life. And the other one says, I've never seen anything like that in my life. That's who i got to be with the rest of my life. And they literally walk up to each other and say, you're the one. Do you buy that idea? It's an ancient Greek notion built on an idea of a myth that says when we are born, we've mentioned this in other lectures, but we'll mention it here again. When you are born, you are born as a perfect sphere, geograph uh, geometric form that's perfect, like a basketball. Your soul, not your body. But your soul is cut in half. Half of your soul goes into you. The other half of your soul goes into somebody else, and then you both are born. For the rest of your life, your two parts of your soul are like a magnet that's constantly trying to find the other one. And when it finally does find the other one, it's like two magnets that go together, correct? That is to say, soul mate. Now, the Greeks invented the concept. We go to Plato's Symposium. You can write that down at 3a, by the way. Plato's Symposium is the title, the dialogue, where this story is often referenced, okay? The idea is, once you've seen your soulmate, bam, it's over. But this, of course, begs the question at 3B, is it love at first sight or lust at first sight? And the second question, how do people who don't have sight fall in love? How do they fall in love if they don't have the ability to see with their eyes? Can those people fall in love? We would say, yeah, yeah. And what about falling in love online? Do you believe in this concept? Is it a good idea to meet somebody online without actually having a picture of that somebody and then get to know that somebody before you ever physically meet this somebody? I had a student who actually missed his class. And I was like, where, where is that student? Oh, you didn't hear he dropped out. I said, what are you talking about he dropped out? No, no, he dropped out. Senior, dropped out. I said, what do you mean dropped out? Like dropped out why? No, no, you didn't hear the story? He met a girl online in Australia. They had been texting back and forth and emailing back and forth for several months. He dropped out of school. He's on a plane. He's flying right now to Sydney. He's going to meet her. She's coming to the airport to meet him, and they're going to get married. I, I did that. I went, why? I said, I was like, what does she look like? Student, pal of his. No idea because none of us have seen a picture of her. And then the drop of the other shoe. Neither has he. They began their relationship as a friendship online and they made an agreement. They would not see each other physically until they had decided they were in love with each other because they didn't want the physical attraction to have anything to do with whether they fell in love or not. Because their argument was, when... The body is involved, and the person is beautiful or physically not so attractive. Whatever. That can change everything. So how about this? We'll just fall in love without the physical. So, dude, this guy was flying to Australia to get off the plane 
to meet his girl for the very first time, and he would see her for the first time. What are your thoughts on that one? Jot it down in your notes at 3B. What are your thoughts on that one? You like that idea, or do you find that to be the most insane concept imaginable? Spencer's sonnet number 35, taking us with hungry eyes to ask a question like that. Thank you.